This is Jocko Podcast number 282 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. A 44-year-old Lawton man was among those involved in a three-day fight recently as part of Operation Attleboro in Vietnam. He is Charles F. Wittis, who is stationed at Fort Sill until June with the 4th Battalion, 30th Infantry, and now serves as a platoon sergeant in Vietnam with Company A, 1st Battalion, 27th Infantry, 25th Infantry Division. The 24-year Army veteran's wife, Florence, and children Pat, David, Sharon, Gary, and Wanda reside in Lawton. A married daughter lives in Litchfield, Minnesota. Operation Attleboro was not the first time Sergeant Wittes has seen action. As he served with the 1st Infantry Division during World War II and saw action in North Africa, Sicily, the Normandy invasion, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. So he had some combat experience. He also served in Korea with the Intelligence and Reconnaissance Platoon of the 19th Infantry Regiment, 24th Infantry Division. Operation Attleboro has been described as the biggest U.S. action of the Vietnam War. The 43-day operation involved some 25,000 American soldiers in the jungles of Tay Ninh Province, northwest of Saigon. It cracked open on the toughest and oldest of Viet Cong strongholds. The campaign ended last Saturday with a claimed bag of more than 1,100 communist regulars killed and nearly 2,400 tons of rice captured plus hordes of other supplies. I don't think that the fighting out there was as bad as in itself as either World War II or Korea, but this was much more confusing. In Korea, You at least had lines. Over here, they were all around you, Sergeant Wittes said. At first, I thought we'd run into a platoon on patrol. But when the fighting continued, I knew we'd run into a much stronger force. I didn't really have time to think about what was going on. My time was spent getting wounded out and getting the ammo to the men. Those assaults were the first I'd seen since Korea. They were just the same type that we called bonsai attacks. Our men were outstanding. As good as any I saw in World War II or Korea. End quote. Another taking part in the operation was PFC John Casarato of Lynnhurst, New Jersey, who received his baptism of fire on those three days. Up to that combat act action, his combat experience had been a short sweep during which his unit received a little sniper fire. I remember the firing was very heavy for a while, and then it stopped, he said. I thought it was over. I'd heard that they hit you and ran, but it was far from over. We were too busy with the wounded to really think about what was happening. The biggest thing I remembered was the sun. It seemed like I couldn't get any place where it was cool enough to think straight. It was worse than I had imagined combat to be. There was a feeling of helplessness. The bullets were flying around us and we couldn't see who was shooting them. I really respect the medics. They were right out there in the middle of it. It was a good feeling to know that if you get wounded, those guys will come and help you. After it was all over, that night I realized what I went through. You wonder why you are alive when a lot of other people are gone. And that's a newspaper article from 1966 from out there in Lawton, Oklahoma. And it's talking about Operation Attleboro, which is mentioned a few times in the article. The operation is named after Attleboro, Massachusetts, where the 196th Light Infantry Brigade had been reactivated out of Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And the 196th initiated this operation after they'd only been in country for about two months. And this 
I would say this newspaper article paints the battle in a very positive picture, but it was a it was a rough battle, very rough battle. The brigade commander was an inexperienced guy. Didn't really have well, he was inexperienced in fighting infantry. Didn't really prioritize and execute. Lost some control at various points of the battle of of what was happening. And in the end, even though, as reported, there was over a thousand enemy killed, there was also um, some significant loss on the American side. 155 men killed and five missing from the 1st, 4th, and 25th Infantry Divisions and the the 196th. And I, I couldn't pin this down. I believe there was four medals of honor that were awarded for actions during this battle. And it was the, the largest largest series of air mobile operations at that time. And it was also a baptism of fire, as I mentioned, for the 196th Light Infantry out of out of Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And as I was reading about this battle, I started thinking about that idea of light infantry and and just doing some reading, doing some research, and I came across a document that I thought was worth discussing. The document is called Proverbs of the Light Infantry, which out of the gate, you know, I'm kind of already thinking, hmm, this is this is gonna be good to go. Uh, it's written by a guy named Major Scott R. McMichael. He's an Army officer, and not only is he a military guy, obviously being in the Army, being a major in the Army, but he's also written a bunch, historically speaking, on light infantry specifically. He wrote a book called A Historical Perspective on Light Infantry. He wrote another book called Stumbling Bear, Soviet Military Performance in Afghanistan. So he's got, you know, like I said, the military background. He's also got this historical background, which I think served him well in putting together this bunch of proverbs, which were published in a magazine that I was lucky enough to find. So let's check out this document. Starts off, history provides many examples that could help define contemporary concepts. Here's an attempt to define the generic light infantry and suggest possible training tasks. Proverbs of the Light Infantry by Major Scott R. McMichael, U.S. Army. So there's an article which I'll go through quickly. What exactly does Army mean by the term light infantry? What is the difference between light infantry and regular infantry? Is light infantry merely regular regular infantry made light by stripping away its heavy equipment and vehicles, or is it something quite different in terms of tactical style, attitudes, and utility? And this is what hit me is, look, when I, when I do these, when I, when I look at something, when I read something, if I'm thinking it's strict military information, then I'll save it for when I go and talk to military troops. Hmm. However, much of the time, what you find is that military information, military knowledge, military proverbs in this place are something that you can take and apply to absolutely anything in life. So when he's talking about light infantry, it sounds super specific. It's a lot more broad. These things can be applied a lot more broadly. Back to the book. Surveying the official literature on the light division, one is hard put to avoid the conclusion that our army leadership is taking the view that light infantry is nothing more than regular infantry made light for the purpose, for the overriding purpose of strategic mobility. A number of facts support this conclusion. First, the initial design parameters for the division focused on restrictions on size, not operational employment. The force designers of the new light division labored under three basic parameters. One, a 10,000 man personnel ceiling. Two, a a deployability limit of 500 or less C-141 sorties. And three, a requirement for the division to have nine battalion maneuver elements. So what he's saying there is when they made this thing, what they what they based it off of is they wanted to be able to deploy this thing rapidly in only 500 flights of C-141s, which is actually a lot of flights. But, <laughs> Seems like it. But, you know, you're going to get 10,000 people deployed in a short amount of time. Okay, so that's what they're looking to do. But he, he goes on a little bit. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. 
there's more there should be more to it it shouldn't be just you're a little bit lighter that shouldn't be the goal of light infantry there should be some differences as well he says certainly the army has not ignored the peculiar tactical characteristics of the division it has after all developed light leaders course and undertaken a multitude of tests and studies to determine how to fight the division but the hallmark of the division remains its strategic lightness not its tactical lightness this is an imbalance, not dismissed lightly. And he literally wrote in here, not a pun. So the, the majors got some, got some comedic chops for I believe that it shows a lack of appreciation for the real meaning of light infantry. So he's arguing here that it's not just a, a, a regular infantry unit that has less equipment. Mm-hmm. They have a different attitude, and he gets to it here. In contrast, and and this is why I think this applies, because we know one of the things that's one of the things that's so fascinating, for instance, about jujitsu is it allows someone who's smaller and weaker to beat someone that's bigger and stronger. Mm-hmm. How can you do that? Tactics, techniques, procedures, strategy, skills. Light infantry, well, light infantry can beat heavier infantry. How do they do that? The same thing that you use in jujitsu. Businesses, well, you're in a business, you've got a competitor that's bigger than you and stronger than you and more capitalized than you are. How can you possibly beat them? That's where I'm going. That's what we wanna know, right? That's why we love the jujitsu, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we kinda we kind of love the light infantry too. And we want to learn from the light infantry. Mm. Just like we learn from jiu-jitsu when we apply it to business, we apply it to life. We can learn from the light infantry so that we can take advantage. <clears throat> so I'm sure you're going to go into it. But the, so the light infantry essentially is um, it's for speed, right? The speed, yep. uh, rapid people, deploy, rapid, rapid deployability. Yeah. But it's like where being the speed is more important or is a significant of significant importance in the situation. So. But with that speed comes certain drawbacks, so they have to apply certain techniques given those drawbacks. Exactly. How does Jeff Glover tap out Echo Charles? Yeah. Can he do it? How does he tap out Jocko? Can he do it because he's bigger and stronger? Mm. Can he do it because he's can apply more force than I can? No. No. He can outmaneuver us. Yeah. He can outmaneuver. He can move. He can use his lightness. And what else does he have? Flexibility. Mm. And then he has special little tactics, techniques, and procedures that he can use. Yeah. Little Jeff Glover, like a little monkey on your back. Yep, monkey <laughs> on your back. <laughs> so here we get into it. In contrast to the general American use of the term light infantry as regular infantry made light, there exists another interpretation, mostly European in context and origins, which is not tied to force structure or strategic mobility nearly so rigidly as it is in the United States. This article sheds light on this opposing concept and cites a list of proverbs which characterizes operations by what could be referred to as classic light infantry. There are three primary characteristics of light infantry which distinguish it from regular infantry. One, an attitude of self-reliance. Two, a propensity for improvisation and flexibility. Three, a specific common tactical style. So those are the three things that he's saying that are the, are the true differentiators. The attitude of self-reliance is probably the most significant of the three attributes since the others are founded on it. Self-reliance is based on high levels of self-confidence, discipline, trust, unit cohesion, and a never-say-die approach to problems. It presupposes the possession of highly developed individual skills not usually found in the regular infantry soldier. So, discipline, trust, unit cohesion, the never say die approach to problems, which I like, but, you know, leadership and strategy and tactics, in that book I talked about, that's good attitude to have, Mm. I'm never gonna quit, but you also need to have the detachment to take a look at a problem where you're throwing all your resources and not winning and say, you know what, I'm gonna throw my resources at this problem in a different way. Mm-hmm. We don't wanna lose the ability to think. Mm-hmm. We don't want never say die to translate to never think of another solution to a problem that we're facing. Yeah. <laughs> 
Light infantry know that no matter what, no matter what the situation, they can make do by turning the situation to their advantage. Love that. Oh, there's there's bad weather? Cool, watch this. We're gonna use that to our advantage. Mm. Oh, there's tough terrain? Great, we're gonna use that to our advantage. Classic light infantry almost disdains logistics, believing that is it is possible to live in, on, and off the land and to use the enemy's supplies and weapons if necessary. Self-reliance transcends unfavorable circumstances and finds a way to accomplish the mission through innovation, imagination, and perseverance. Disdains logistics. We don't even want support. We don't even want a supply chain. We're gonna live off the land. The light infantry's attitude of self-reliance leads directly to a propensity for flexibility and improvisation. The light infantry cannot afford a rigid approach to tactical problems. So I love that because now we're going back on the fact that we have a, a, a never say die attitude. Guess what? We also can't afford a rigid approach to tactical problems. So we got a good dichotomy that's getting balanced out now. We were a little nervous at first. Instead, light infantry seeks to respond quickly to change, turning its strengths against the enemy's weaknesses in ways that the enemy does not expect. Yes, jujitsu. The light infantry leader improvises to accomplish his mission by changing his tactics and organization whenever necessary. So that's very different from traditional military thought, right? Oh, we got a different problem? Let's just change our organization, change our tactics. What do we gotta do? Mm. Old equipment is used in new ways and new methods are developed to meet a changing situation. Light infantry is light of foot, so to speak, and light and quick of mind as well. I wouldn't even see as well. I'd say that's probably the predominant trait that we want. Mm -hmm. Light of mind, quick of mind. Amazing how people get entrenched in their own little ideas or their own big ideas. <laughs> yes, sir. Entrenched. Yeah. Can't move. The light infantry uses improvisation and flexibility as a combat multiplier, thereby frequently achieving a psychological advantage over an enemy which may outman and outgun it. <clears throat> I was talking to someone the other day, a uh, client, and the... I'm I'm hearing him he's he's trying he's asking me to help him come up with a strategic plan. A B C D E F. And he's getting some resistance, you know, he's got different parts of the team pulling him in different directions. And he's having a hard time making a decision of like, well, we could do this but then if this happens. We could do that but then I'm worried about this. So mm. it's a problem. And what I, I'm sitting there listening to him, and I'm thinking, and I, I have to play this mental game with myself mm. because the way that you don't find an answer when you're talking to someone is to try so hard to understand what their perspective is that you become wrapped up in the problem yourself. Mm. So I was kind of doing that. I'm thinking, well, you know, he says, well, you know, this group is saying that we should do this, and this other group is saying that we should do that. And I'm starting to weigh those two groups out and see which ones, you know, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. I'm starting, I'm getting too close to it. Yeah. So I'm listening. So what I have to do is I have to actually play this little game with myself where I, where I say, okay, what would I actually really do if I was in this situation? Mm. And I said, hey, neither one of these groups know what's going to happen and neither do you. And you, right now, are trying to make a rigid plan about a future that is unknown to you. Mm. Let's reassess the plan and come up with one that revolves around flexibility and adaptability, not not around rigidity. Problem solved. Mm. And and, and that's really all it took. That's really all it took. How can we come up with a more flexible plan? We don't know. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? No. Okay, so we can come up with a plan, but we want a flexible plan because you can plan to go to the beach, but we don't know what the weather's going to be. Yeah, it's kind of like the overpacking thing we talked about a long time ago where... uh, Refresh my memory. You know, like that's why you wind up overpacking 
because you're like, what if we do this? What if we do that? What if we do this? What if we go to dinner? What if we go Mm -hmm. swimming? What if we go whatever? It's like, bro, you don't know if you're even going to go. You don't even have a plan to go to dinner, even though you kind of know you go to dinner sometimes, you know, and then you do that too much. Bro, you're over here overpacking. Yeah, you unless know? you're Levison. Levison, <laughs> remember yeah. Levison? No, that's he's a light going, traveler. He's, he's had the Iran. That's some light infantry <laughs> traveling England. right there. Yes, sir. <laughs> and he's got a backpack <laughs> and eight dollars. He might be straight up over light infantry traveling. I was thinking about. I was thinking about him from this perspective. You know, you do so much contingency planning, right? Yeah. In the military, what if this happens? What if that happens? He must have been looking at contingency plans, like, oh, don't worry. Yeah, it'll, it'll be good. Figure we'll figure it out. It out. Yeah. And that's the key to, that's one of the keys to light infantry. Yeah. Flexible planning. Yeah. Especially with that approach, you know. So you you go to, in, in our case, we'll go to Kauai. You need a certain amount of things that you need, you're going to yep, need. Like seven. Yeah. Like shorts. Your surf shorts. In fact, you get the hybrid shorts. The surf shorts plus casual. Okay. See what I'm saying? We're good. Yeah. I, th- I think we have some of those. Yeah, by we the do. Way. <laughs> uh, you know, a shirt, uh, you know, a few shirts or whatever. Make sure you have a laundry machine over there or toothbrush. access to one, toothbrush. Toothpaste, if but you, have, you can kind of get toothpaste there and really a toothbrush. Yeah, and that's a big part too where, you know, kind of like living off the land, and this sounds dumb, I know, but it, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. <laughs> so you ever like go to like LA Did you just count going to Vons as living <laughs> off the land? <laughs> I think you did. It is the travel version of living off the land okay. when you go to right. a civilized place, is what Maybe I'm saying. It's a stretch, you, you know when you go to like LA or something mm-hmm. and you're like, shoot, I'm gonna be there for two days, um, you know, two, two and a half hour drive or whatever. It's like, oh, I, I better bring enough toothpaste or I better, bro, you can stop at any store in LA and get You're just toothpaste. living off the land, bro. Don't pack Look at all this that guy. stuff. Look you at can this guy. <laughs> off the land. It's the same thing. That'd be actually a good reality television. Echo living off the living land. off the <laughs> land. Going Roll, into foreign stores. Rolling, oh, yeah. rolling into a Ralph's in LA. <laughs> I can make this work. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's exactly the same it's the thing. Travel dude. It's version. the exact same no, thing. Man. Never mind hunting, building a bow, hunting down and killing an animal and skinning it. Never mind that. No, no, that's too advanced. We're rolling into Vons. <laughs> Check. All right, so we're staying flexible. We are prepared to live off the land if, need if needed. If there's a washer dryer there, boom. Oh, well, yeah. You don't got to bring that much clothes. You see what I'm saying? My first deployment. I went to Guam. Hell yeah. And I thought I was going to Nam, right? <laughs> so I wasn't, I, I didn't plan for like a bunch of civilian stuff to be happening. I yeah. didn't plan to be, you know, down at the beach yeah. all day, uh-huh. most days, which is what we actually did yeah. on my first deployment. Yeah. And I think I had maybe two pairs of shorts and I just wore them the entire time. I would yeah. wear one for like a week because you're just in the ocean, you're, you know, you're taking a, a fresh water shower yeah. and you're just yeah. totally good to go. Yeah. Living off the land as they say. Yeah, man, that's a, <laughs> and that's how, uh, that's how Kauai is too. Mm-hmm. Like you're wearing your, your shorts that you're going to the beach in yeah. pretty much the whole time, pretty much. Yeah. So yeah, you bring two of those, you're pretty good. Pretty, pretty you solid. got backup. You got backup, yeah. That's <laughs> true. That's true. Check. See, I knew there was light infantry application. Even the Echo Charles' <laughs> yeah. existence, we're there. Yeah, yeah. We're there. Mm-hmm. All right, back to the book. Not surprisingly, self-reliance, improvisation, and flexibility produce a unique tactical style as the key features of which are surprise, stealth, shock, and offensiveness. The light infantry always seeks to retain the initiative to keep the enemy off balance. That was, uh, here's a good quote from Dean Lisch, because I was training with him the other day and while he was teaching class, he said, okay, so the guy on the bottom, across side, what advantages does he have? Were you here for this class? Uh, No, but given what you're saying right now, he has said this. Yeah. So he, he, you know, and everyone kind of throws, actually there's not a lot of guesses. Cause let's face it, when you're on the bottom, when someone's across side on you, you're not feeling a bunch of advantages is, at yeah. all. Okay. So he looked at it with a positive attitude. Mm. And he said, no, when you're on the bottom and someone's across side on you, you can't fall down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a good attitude. Yes, it is. It's a good attitude. I thought of another one, I didn't say it to him, I'll have to discuss it with him. It's d- the, the person, is going to have to give space to submit you in most cases from across side. There's mm-hmm. going to be an opportunity when if people try and submit you. Mm-hmm. If people just hold you, you're you're going to get held. Yeah. But if they make movement to advance position 
or to submit you, there the advantage that you have is there's going to be some space. Yeah. Like, I think there's even less space if 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 I'm in Dean Lister's closed guard, I feel like I can move less even when he's going for something than if he's cross side. That's yeah. kind of how I feel. Gosh. It might be particular to my style or whatever, but yeah. you can't fall down when you're already on the ground. That's true. That's a big advantage, I guess. Yeah. <sighs> Off balance. The way that a good jujitsu player will attack your balance, that is just, that. that's the same thing we have to think about on the battlefield. How can we keep the enemy off balance in the business world? If the, if the, if the competitors know exactly what we're gonna do, they just plan for it. They make a plan. And the more they think they know what you're gonna do, the less flexible their plan is. Mm. So when you do something that throws them off balance, it's gonna be good for you. Mm. Light infantry operates most frequently at night and uses terrain at hand to full advantage. Light infantry is terrain oriented and is able to switch operations from one type of terrain to another without paralysis of the mind. Mm -hmm. Paralysis of the mind. How often you see that? A shift, it's, it's very, it's actually a specific thing. A switch in terrain, a switch mm -hmm. in environment and people lock up. Mm -hmm. I see it. Yeah, I could see that. Especially, and this goes back to something they already said, especially when it's a surprise. Mm. If I surprise you with something, yeah. that's when brain freeze happens. Mm. If you kind of see it coming, you're preparing right. for it. Yeah, so yeah. it's almost like surprise has to be utilized to cause people to freeze up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In my opinion. Moreover, in combat, the light infantry is logistics conscious, but not logistics dependent. Light infantry relies on superior tactics, not superior firepower to win the battle. That's jujitsu. The short discussion, this short discussion barely scratches the surface of the issue. It does, however, capture the essence of classic light infantry. The proverbs, which are listed here, go into more detail and hopefully clarify the picture somewhat further. They have been gleaned from the close study of several excellent light infantry forces in the recent past. Although many of these proverbs apply equally well to regular infantry, as a group, they do a fair job of embodying the nature of classic light infantry as distinct from regular infantry. In conclusion, even though many of these proverbs should be embraced by all infantry, not just light infantry, history has demonstrated the difficulty of including the difficulty of inculcating the light infantry virtue or style, except in small segments, usually elite elements of national armies. So what he's saying there is, these are great, and they'll work for regular infantry, but these, are a these, these skills are a little bit harder to grow inside of an organization. So chances are, even though they're a good idea to try, chances are you're not gonna be as effective making this happen. Now, I can tell you that I think this thing was written, deck, I don't know, 40, 40 years ago, something like that. I think times have changed. I, th I think you'd find that going out and m me actually working with light infantry units, man, they're good. Mm -hmm. So, or sorry, with regular infantry units as well, and armored infantry units as well. Like I've worked with all of them. Mm -hmm. And they're all freaking good to go. That's what ha you get good when you've been at war as a nation for you know a couple decades. Mm -hmm. <sighs> the U.S. Army particularly has a history of being tied to its logistics chain and has relied more on firepower than on military art for its victories. Some truth to that. Let us assume that the new light infantry divisions should be trained in the classic light infantry style. The army may find it difficult to do so since it. It is a style with which we are basically unfamiliar except for our specialty forces, particularly the Ranger Battalions. The first step, however, is for the Army to decide what it means by light infantry. Is it merely light infantry made light by the absence of heavy equipment, or is it something more like what has been described here? This is a question which should be answered quickly, for it has a significant bearing on the training, strategy, and leadership of our new light divisions. So that's kind of his intro. I think it's a good solid intro. 
I think it gives us an idea. And it also, again, the reason I think this is so in, uh, so usable mm -hmm. is because we're talking about a smaller, weaker force yeah. going up against a bigger, stronger force. This is maneuver warfare. This is indirect attacks. That's what this is. Mm. That's why it applies. Yeah, it's, it, I feel like this applies to more people, especially when you want to start applying it to other than something other than military stuff where because it's so feels like it anyway that so often we find ourselves in a situation where it's like dang i don't have like the experience i don't have the resources i don't have the you know i'm not as big as that guy or whatever and we feel like we kind of don't have a chance you know because they they're just so up far ahead of us in that way so it's like oh no one has a chance you know they're they're like a monopoly in whatever way you know yeah <laughs> But it's not the case, you know? It's true. And you know what's interesting from a business perspective? So I, I work with all different industries, right? But one day I'll be talking to a client who is the small startup, you know, 400 employees on the growth pattern. They're making things happen, but they still can't. They still have some disadvantages against the big boys. Right. And so I'll be talking to them about, okay, here's what we need to do. You need to work as, you know, you need to work on your mobility. How can we outmaneuver the enemy? Like all those things. Mm -hmm. The next day or even the next hour, I'll be talking to one of the big companies mm -hmm. that has all these little elements out there, these small startups that are trying to snatch business share. What are we going to do to immobilize those small? So yeah. I actually end up teaching both insurgency and counterinsurgency, depending on the client. Mm -hmm. And it's what's crazy. good is that I, since I, since I, I, I'm familiar with how each one of those components needs to win, mm -hmm. so I can help them counter right. <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So it boils down to execution too. Mm -hmm. It boils down to execution. Can you actually do what I'm talking about? Because yeah. if you can't come up with a flexible plan. Or you can come up with a flexible plan, but you don't have the leadership to, to actually make it happen. Yeah. You're you're not going to make it happen. Yeah, that's so true, huh? So even like the, the like the he talked about the mindset early on, the mindset that we're looking to change direction, we're looking to be creative. Like it's quick, you know, quick. Unlike, you know, let's face it, the bigger a I don't know, I'm thinking of a company by the way, but if. Like the bigger the company is, the more it seems like, hey, you better have your protocols in place that we all follow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the thing can get all unorganized. So it's like For they sure. kind of have no choice but to be a little bit more rigid in that way. Rigid, bureaucratic, very stable, yeah. very difficult to change. So... What does that mean? That means when you're a small company, you're like, oh, you client needs this, guess what? We can do that for you. You can turn around and we'll shift how we do things right. for you. Yeah, the big, yeah. the big companies, uh, we don't actually do that. Yeah, let me put you on hold you, real quick. You can, uh. you can, we'll, you will give you the system that we use and you can use the system we use. The small client's like, we'll adapt our system. No yeah. factor, let's do it. Shoot it, don't get them on customer service. Bruh, you, you go to a big company, customer service, they're gonna be outsourcing, reading scripts, like all this stuff, because they kinda got in a, in a big way where it's like, hey, we need everyone to give the same quote unquote quality customer service. Like we need, you know, you gotta know all this stuff about our big long standing company, you know, right, to help right. these people. So you so, better be educated. Right, you know? so, good example. Big company, maybe they, they know that they're gonna lose out on customer service, because the small company can can adapt quicker and make adjustments. So that means the big company needs to invest more in that area. Mm -hmm. And maybe they need to hire some experts and maybe they need to dump some money into uh, you know, computer help where I can actually log into your computer and I can help if we're talking about a software, right? I can, mm -hmm. oh, you know, pro no problem, Mr. Charles, I'll tell you what, if you type in this code word, I'll get into your computer right now and I can get that fixed for you, mm -hmm. right? You wanna put money, so you know where your weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. You identify your weaknesses and then you fix them. And if you're the small guy, you know where the enemy's weaknesses are, the big guy's weaknesses are, and you exploit those. Exploit them. You start making fun of them. <laughs> start capitalizing <laughs> on them. Which you gotta be careful, because if I start, if you're the big guy and I start making fun of your customer service, you, you, you're a big guy, you'll dump a bunch of money in customer service, all of a sudden you'll start beating me there. Yeah. So I gotta be careful, I don't wanna provoke the big guy. Yeah. Maybe I just wanna stay under the radar yeah. and, and keep take, taking customers from you, and you don't really know why.
It's because I respond to every single customer service issue, you know, with a team that's going to talk directly to you within three minutes. That's a very, uh, that's a very significant concept, staying under the radio, radar. Mm-hmm. I think it's underrated, too, because the, even just as a human being, it feels like you want the attention, you want the credit, you want the recognition for this, oh, you want to win sure. the award, you want them to sure. know you won, or, you know. Even more scary or counterproductive is you want the enemy to know that yeah. you just did this. Yeah. And that's more counterproductive because now you're giving away what your position is. Yeah. You're giving away what you're doing to achieve victory. And, bro, that goes deep because even even if you're not like – Cause no, you know, like, okay, if you want the enemy to know, right. That's like some like, Hey, this is me against you. I got something against you personally. So boom. Yeah. I got you. What kind of a thing, right? It's like a challenge almost kind of thing. But even if like just everyday stuff, you know, how some people, for example, they'll make, they'll start making a lot of money or something and then they'll buy like jewelry or something like that oh, or some, yeah. something flashy, you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, they, maybe they have some online following or something mm-hmm. and then they want to show their nice cars and their nice house and they want to do all this stuff, right? Just to sh- like yeah. show, how do, it's like a need, I guess, you know, for recognition or whatever. Bruh, now w- well, what you did is you provoked the giant now. Mm-hmm. You made everyone know about their stuff. Now this giant, whatever that may be, I don't know how that translates, but it is something where there be people trying to take advantage of that, people asking you for stuff, um, you know, people trying to use your X, Y, Z that you just showed them that you have, by the way. Voluntarily. Apparently. Voluntarily, yeah, because you needed some work. Now they're they're going to try to find a way to use that for their advantage, and then it's like everybody too. Potentially, <laughs> that's the giant. There's your giant right there. You got to watch out for that. You got to watch out for your ego getting you to do things that are stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up. Probing the giant or whatever. You know, like even in, uh, in Iraq, in Ramadi, we didn't want, we tried to, we didn't want the enemy to know what was happening. Like, why are why are people getting shot? What's happening? Mm. You know, we don't. We're like, oh yeah, we're snipers. We got teams in, in play. No, just all of a sudden they start losing guys. Yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> they yes, don't sir. know why. It's, now it's fear. And I mean, obviously they figured out pretty quick. Right. <clears throat> Check. All right. So now we get into the to the uh, proverbs themselves. The proverbs of the light infantry. Here we go. Light infantry, light infantry operations. There exists a light infantry attitude which can be described in a few characteristic words. Offensiveness, initiative, surprise, improvisation, and total self-reliance. There's a part where we could just end the podcast right now, right? Because if you take those were those concepts to the nth degree, mm-hmm. you, you, you know what we're talking about but you won't get the full impact. Light forces are undaunted by terrain. Terrain is viewed as an ally. A combat multiplier for the light infantrymen, light forces are terrain oriented. Very little terrain is impassable to true light infantrymen. Now what I, this to me, one thing that I was taught as a young frogman, when there's bad weather or there's bad terrain, that means that the enemy has to contend with it yeah. and they're not going to and we are yeah and and so terrain oh there's horrible steep crazy hills cool yeah, yeah. that means the enemy's not going to be on patrol up there we will be yeah undaunted light infantry does its best when it lives on in and off the land it must be comfortable in the bush or in Ralph's, if you're sure. Coach Ross in LA for two days, <laughs> uh, that you know, how much of that? Okay, so let's take jujitsu. How much of it is jujitsu good? Because let's face it, if you play out like zombie apocalypse in your head, mm-hmm. you kind of think, hey, when it comes down to it, if I can beat people in fights, look. Because we, we, we ran out of bullets. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you get to a point where, hey, man, it's going to yeah. come down to me against you. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that that being able to survive that you get from jujitsu. Yeah. Actually, that that's a, a real raw kind of form of it, you know, where... <clears throat> and we I think we actually talk about this. I forget. I think it was just me. We were just talking where you can have like a big group of people 
and then they can, and you and the group can be heavily armed and then be, and then have a bunch of knives and then have body armor or whatever whatever right just all the tools and all the whatever there's a, like you can lose your weapons you can lose your knives you can lose your body armor or forget it or i don't know whatever but at some point it's very possible that it's going to be just like you said it's me against you mm-hmm. no knives no weapons no whatever yeah could be that way in about an hour and a half <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> and then it's like, then where are you? Is it night and day? Right. You know, or are you just business as usual kind of kind of thing? Like, you know, the, I don't know. I'm th- I, it makes me go back to video games. But you know how, like, you go, there's a game called Xanic. Actually, I feel like I brought this up before where if you get, like, this weapon. Is this the super spreader? Oh, yeah, that one too. Yeah, <laughs> on Contra. When you get the spreader, you're like, boom, boom, and you're, you can win. Oh, it's called the spreader. I called it the super spreader because yeah. of this Rona. <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) but once you die and lose that weapon and you go back to just what you're issued in the video game which is what we call the pea shooter you gotta be good with that thing Mm -hmm. and if you're not you're just gonna game over that's why be comfortable in the bush it's true good intelligence is vital to light infantry intelligence obtained by the light infantry from every source from the national level to the use of local inhabitants, reconnaissance and patrolling. Yeah, gathering information, absolutely. Conventional tactics are no good for light forces. You know, I, I we'd have to dig down and see what you're actually talking about when you're talking about conventional tactics. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bless that one on the spot. I get it. Right? You can't plan. Sometimes, for instance, conventional forces will plan for a certain number of casualties for a certain operation. Like, you're just going to take these casualties. Mm -hmm. You get into light infantry, smaller units, that can be a real problem. You can't just accept casualties. Mm -hmm. For example, historically, light infantry operations are mounted at battalion level and lower. Light infantry operations are highly dependent on squad, platoon, and company level actions. Got it. Light forces need high quality communications to coordinate decentralized efforts into a coherent whole. Okay, so this this article was written 40, 50 years ago, something like that. And it's just interesting to me, communications of all kinds are unreliable. Mm. Radios, they're all unreliable in a combat zone. And if you don't have coordination measures in effect that don't rely on radio communications, you can count on there to be problems. And and I'll tell you, even as our as our as our communication capabilities get better, when you start talking about fighting against near peer adversaries, meaning big giant countries like ours that have big giant technological uh, equipment like we have, you, you can't you get to a point where you can't use radios because they have something called DFing capability. Have you ever heard of that? Mm. Direction finding capability. Mm. So if you key up your radio, they know where you are. Mm. Your radio gives off radio waves. Mm. And there are ways that radi- those radio waves can be detected and they can pinpoint your location. Mm. So, so you have to be able to operate with minimal, minimal, Communications. So I don't like the, the this this particular one because it says light forces need high quality communications to coordinate decentralized efforts into a coherent whole. Actually, I don't I don't like that. When I tell you this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. I give you the commander's intent. I want you to be able to go, and I don't need to talk to you again. Mm-hmm. And by the way, you'll see whatever other unit needed to do something, coordinate with you. You're going to know what's happening by what's happening. Mm-hmm. You're going to see an explosion. You're like, oh. Leif's platoon just started their breach. That means I can go. Like, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You need to be able to coordinate things. You can't be reliant on radios. You can't. There was probably a year, there's probably a five, five year time period where you, where the radios were good and the enemy direction finding capability wasn't quite there yet. Mm. But that period's over. Mm. <laughs> uh, Due to a general shortage of combat support, light forces must do an excellent job of combining arms when they have a chance. Yes, absolutely. You've got to be able to work with the other units that can support you. 
You gotta be able to do it. Light infantry forces must be masters of improvisation, familiar with all kinds of weapons, vehicles, landing craft, and so forth. Yes. Light infantry forces make use of whatever is at hand to improve their combat capability. Da- absolutely. Native irregular forces are often used in support of light infantry. Yes. What does that mean? That means you have to go build relationships with the local populace. That's what that means. And in order to do that, you got to know that that's what you need to do. Because 18-year-old kids with machine guns aren't focused on building relationships. They're not. They go into a country, they have a machine gun, they have grenades, and if the, what they think they're gonna do is huck grenades and shoot machine guns. Mm. So you need to educate them and make sure that they understand how the local populace is going to play a role in giving you support. Light infantry must remain flexible in mind and action capable of reacting quick, quickly. Already talked about flexible plans, flexible mind. When a light infantryman rises from his sleep, he is ready to fight. I like that. Light infantrymen rely on camouflage. Why is that? Because we don't want to give away our position. We don't want to advertise what we're doing. We don't want to advertise how we're beating the competition. Mm -hmm. We want to have camouflage. Against heavy enemy forces, the light infantry always requires a great deal of augmentation. Cool. You've got to, you've got to face the reality that you may not have the resources that are needed to defeat a bigger, stronger enemy. You have to be able to say that. So if you're, you know, that's why, that's why there's a lot of industries right now where you can get help inside your small business. You can get IT support. You can get personnel support. You can get engineering support. You can get all this kind of support. And you've got to recognize when you need to utilize some of that other support. You might not necessarily want to build it out. I had this conversation, Leif was just telling me this, when we were starting EF Online. And you know we started talking about building this and building that. And I said, hey Leif, we don't want to become a software company. Mm. And he was like, check. Mm. You know, because it's better to f- hire someone that does that. That's what they do for. I don't want to I don't want to have a bunch of uh, software engineers and programmers and IT. So I don't want we don't want to have all that. Yeah. That's a different business. Yeah, fully. We don't want to be an IT. We don't want to be a software company. We want to be a leadership training company. Cool. And he was he was like, "Got it." Yeah. Because we had started, because it, it's one of those mission creep things, right? Where yes. you're like, you're like, well, if we just add this, we just build that. And all of a sudden, yep. you got a proprietary system that you got to maintain. Maintain and hire more people. We're not for looking to do that. And, yeah, yeah. We, why? We think light infantry. And what you need to do is use augmentation if needed. Light infantry men must be able to climb, crawl, swim, ski, snowshoe, repel, stalk, run, and hide. Obviously, Echo, this was written before snowboarding existed because yeah. I know you're over there <laughs> thinking. For those of you that don't know, Echo's now a snowboarder. <laughs> Isn't it interesting to actually talk about the fact that you got to have all these different ways of getting around by using your own energy? Yeah. Light infantry must be able marksmen, proficient in the use and maintenance of many weapons. Light forces rely on pioneer skills at all level, beginning with the squad to properly exploit terrain. Pioneer skills. Does that mean you have a Ralph's card? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you better know where yeah. everything is. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Otherwise, you get lost. These foreign stores, you know, can be hostile. Do you remember driving around? Yeah, you do. Remember, no G- like GPS is just so. Yeah. It's a given It's now. given now. Yeah. It's a given. How did you get around before GPS? Do you remember off the top of your head? Like you're in a new spot or you're going to a new spot kind of far away. Map. You brought a map? Mm, no, you get a map. Yeah. Well, I guess if so I was going map. somewhere where there wasn't going to be a way to live off the land and go into a <laughs> convenience store and buy a map. <laughs> sure, buy a map. Uh, I was taking my daughter to Coronado like a, a little while ago. And so Coronado is where I worked for 20 whatever years. Yeah. And what, I live now f- a few miles from Coronado. 
and we get in the car and I, you know, start pulling out. My daughter's like, do you want to put it in the GPS? Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> You're all consulting. I'm, I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. I, 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 I said, are you serious right now? And she says, yeah, why? Mm. And I go, it's Coronado. I, I worked there for 20 freaking years. Yeah. And she's like, well, I didn't, I don't know. Yeah. And, but that's, <laughs> be, but that's her mentality is yeah. when you get in a car and you're going somewhere, your GPS. Oh yeah, huh? Cause she's, this she's just young the way like it that. is. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, but well, cause I had the exact same incident. It wasn't Coronado. It was downtown. And I used to work downtown for a number of years and go down there, whatever. Mm. So I know downtown, but I know downtown like back of my hand. Yeah. And we're going and same thing. She who, puts it in Sarah. Who, Sarah? Yeah, puts it in the, or is like, she puts it in her GPS in her phone and starts rattling off oh, the directions yes. as if I don't know, you know, Look at this, this man, guy. <laughs> man of the world doesn't know, um, you know, how to get to the place we're going to <laughs> downtown, my hood, yeah. whatever. Um, so yeah, I don't need that GPS. But if, the thing is, Sarah's not as young as your daughter, obviously, mm. but it does start to become like a habit, yeah. you know? I mean, just so happened I knew my way around. I think if I didn't know my way around, yeah, same thing, yeah. automatic style. Like yeah. I don't even think twice about it. Like in back in the day, I used to go, um, you know, to places or whatever, and I remember going in the f- either the white pages or the yellow pages or whatever. They'd have the map mm. in the front of it, and then I'd write down directions. That's it. I got lost before two couple times, but it's, it's not not quite as effective as yeah. GPS. I wonder what how much that skill is just being lost now. I'm sure. It feels like it's gone, yeah, yeah, straight up gone. gone. You can find w- one or two guys. And and we could be real negative about that. Yeah. Or we could also be, well, what skills have people now garnered because they don't have to worry about that skill anymore? Yeah. Huh. Not sure. <laughs> the next one, the pertinent, ranger standards of land navigation are a must for light forces. Gotta know where you're going. Gotta know where you are. Yeah. Light infantry rarely uses roads or trails. What does that mean? How does that apply? I'll tell you it applies. You find new ways of doing things. Mm. And just because there's a beaten path doesn't mean you should necessarily take it. Doesn't mean you can't take it. Mm. But you should think, is there a better way to get this done? Light infantry forces left in combat theaters for long inevitably become heavier due to the acquisition of heavier weapons plus increased logistic structure. What does that mean? Keep moving. Keep moving. The minute you settle down, now you're going to start to now you're going to start to grow in ways that aren't necessarily beneficial. Light infantry appreciates heavy fire support when it is available, but is not dependent on it. Physical conditioning and mental strength are absolute musts across the board. Light forces. This goes into the next section, which is called the offense. Light forces may be deployed at the operational level of war, but they always fight at the tactical level. Light forces think at the tactical level. And, okay, there's another one. I'm like, "Mm, I got to press pause on that one. I'm not blessing fully. Okay, except for, I guess, caveat. Light forces think at the tactical level, but you better understand the strategic goal. You have to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Otherwise, you can't think at the tactical level. Yeah. Because if I say, all right, Echo, we want to take out that building. And you say, cool, got it. And you get in there and there's a little bit of resistance, so you you know, blow it up. Yeah. And then I say, actually, strategically, we're trying to keep the infrastructure in place here. And you're like, oh, you might not want to let me know that. Yeah. So thinking tactical is cool. It better be nested inside the strategic goals. Yeah. Does your team... Where's your team at, by the way? In your business, in your company, in your family, where, where's their head at? Do they understand the tactical goals that you're going for? Do they understand, are those tactical goals nested inside what we're trying to do strategically? Good question. True light infantry loves the night. Light, light forces fight at night and hide during the day. What, 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 how, does it, how does that apply? I'll tell you how. You need to understand where you're at at an advantage. That's what that's saying. Mm. Look, night, day, whatever. We're not we're not transferring this. You know, you're you're not going to be. Hey, our, you know, our construction company is going to do better at night. That's not what we're saying. Mm. What you say is, hey, there's a there's an area of construction that we're good at. We're really good at 
high-end custom homes or we're really good at multiple massive track homes that we just repeat the same you're gonna be find what you're good at Mm. and you're gonna exploit that you're gonna start focusing on that area you're gonna hide from the areas where you're gonna get beat Mm. light infantry attacks violently and suddenly on two or more axes seeking flanks and rear of the enemy right we're not going toe-to-toe we're not This isn't a pugilistic endeavor where we stand here and punch each other. We maneuver. We get to flanks. This is, uh, you can see how all this stuff just fits right into my brain. (laughs) It just fits right into my brain. Attacks are conducted fiercely and tenaciously against enemy weaknesses, not strength. Not the enemy's strengths. That's maneuver warfare. Maneuver warfare. We maneuver to where the enemy is weak. That's jujitsu. We put my deadlift power, which is my hips and my back, against Echo's curling power, which is an arm lock. And despite your relatively powerful curling uh-huh. capabilities, sure. doesn't compare to my deadlift. I understand. And the arm lock will win. Light forces attack stripped for action. So... When you're in the field, you can be end up carrying a lot of equipment. When you go on the attack, they're saying, here, don't carry that equipment with you into the attack. Mm. What, this is, what this is is prioritize and execute. Mm. Look, we carried all this weight in. Now we need to focus on the biggest problem we've got, which is doing this assault. Mm. Take off your gear. Leave your water behind. Not all of it. Leave a bulk of your water behind. Leave your cold mm. weather gear. Leave that stuff behind. We're going on an assault. We're going to be light. It's going to take us an hour, and we're going to win. That doesn't mean you leave everything. Light infantry creates a shock effect by the suddenness and fierceness of their attacks. Check. Attacks are closely synchronized, which is fine. Again, you have to coordinate things so that Perfect synchronicity is not a requirement for success because perfect synchronicity is likely not going to happen. Mm. If you don't put some fudge in your schedule for the manufacturing of your new item, the chances that every piece of that item that you're manufacturing comes out exactly as desired and then fits perfectly with the rest of the pieces that you've manufactured, the chances of that happening are very small. So if you put your, if you put everything reliant on perfect synchronization, you're dumb. We don't want to do that. Can it, are there situations where you do need to do that? Sure, you're launching a freaking rocket into space. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, you've got, NASA, you've got all these people focused on one thing that that literally cannot have any issues. Mm. So there's all these checks and balances the whole way through and you eventually get a very, 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 very high probability of success. However, it's still not perfect. Mm-hmm. And if you tried to keep going until you, everything was perfect, you wouldn't ever launch a rocket because you can't get everything completely squared away. Mm. So if you're not at risk of losing a $500 billion or whatever, a trillion dollar rocket, and what you're trying to do is get 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 something to market, you need to not rely on perfect synchronization. Things won't be perfectly synchronized. You need to be okay with that. If you have a, a propensity to be super anal retentive about every little thing, it's gonna be hard for you to be in a leadership position without letting some of that go. You have to be like, eh, you know, it's pretty close. You know, there's some people that cannot say that. Yeah. There's yeah. some people that cannot say, oh, that's pretty good. We could be pretty close. That'll work. Yeah. Isn't that one of the main initial challenges of becoming like, uh, what do you call it? When you got to start delegating, when you have a mm-hmm. growth situation or whatever. Like, that's the main one, I would say. Absolutely. Almost, right? Where it's it's like one a, of the main ones, yes. Yeah. Where you can't, like, can't let it go. Just I would do ride. this perfectly. Yeah. Cool. But you have 14 other things you need to focus on. Yeah, yeah. Get a grip. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> light infantry always, and that is italicized in the text, 
when you're when I was an English major, they call things the text. Sure. Like, well, what, what, are you referring to the text? Yeah. What's the difference between the text and the copy? Uh, copy is what they say in the in the. I, that's more of like a marketing word. Marketing, they'll be like, like, hey, did you? can you check the copy on this latest thing? So, it's one of those buzzwords. So it's like the purpose of what has been written. That kind of dictates whether you call it the text or the yeah, copy. Yeah, but the English you know, professors, yeah. I think it's an elevated yeah, way yeah. of speaking because they don't want to say, well, what do you think of this book? Right? Gotcha. Which is what a human would say. Right, which is what a person, person would say. Yeah, sure. They say, why don't you give me some feedback on, on this text? <laughs> you're like, well, bruh. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because yep. they're getting p- paid money, and so they can't just call it a book I know, or a that's, play. That's way more right? important than Did that. you read yeah. the play? Mm-hmm. What did you think of that play? Mm-hmm. No, it's, how do, what was the impact of that text on you? Yeah. Like, uh, Come yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, it's not even necessary. Sometimes. <laughs> then again, I'm sure there's a real a reason, you know? Maybe yeah, not. No, you're right. You're right. There is a reason. And if we were, I'm sure we're going to get some English professor that's going to drop the hammer of grammar on us. Yeah. You know, say, well, text actually refers to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's one of those things where it could be where, you know how like there was a reason back in the day yeah. where the reason was like significant and you yeah. could get it. You could jam it up if you didn't like distinct or distinguish or whatever. And then, but so much has happened since then. And then, you know, the classic, you yeah. know, guys or whatever, they're like holding on to it yeah. saying like, no, it is important and all this stuff. It's like, bro, no, no, it's not because I know exactly what you're talking about still. But you, you know, know what I love about this particular case? Guess what a text now means? It means I sent you a <laughs> four-word text. That's my kids text each other. Yeah. And they they got funny texts. My uh so you know how I don't know my son when he texts there's you know how well I have an iPhone and it has an autocorrect, right? Yep. So it automatically capitalizes letters, automatically puts periods in. That's how that's this that's the Default setting. I'm pretty sure of the phone, yeah, right? I think so. Yeah. He must have manually goes in there and removes those, so everything he writes is just no, <laughs> Correction. no corrections, <laughs> no capitalization, yeah. and no punctuation of any kind. It's just words. It's just uncapitalized words. Savage. And then my kids were telling me, if you put a period. If you if you text me Echo and you're like, hey, can you make it to dinner tonight? Mm-hmm. And I write no, period. The mm-hmm. period's kind of like aggressive. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't know. I forget if you told me that. Oh man, yeah, yeah. that's crazy, huh? How this whole yeah. like we'll say for lack of a better culture texting culture mm-hmm. it takes on this whole like these rules and yeah. etiquette and yeah. all this stuff. Man, that's crazy. It's like if if something's in all cap. Well, I guess if it was in all caps, it'd be. More of an exclamation, right? Even I think all texting. caps is like all cap. All caps is straight up, almost like fighting words, right? That's, if I'm all yeah. capping you, oh yeah, it's a where it's going. It's, but that seems it's like on. carryover from even before text messaging went. The all caps is like an exclamation. Yeah, yeah. That was your jam in the beginning. All caps. What what did I all caps? When you started texting. Oh, like when I started texting you? Yeah. Well, well you didn't text everyone like that. It was just uh, me. I don't texting. really know. You used to always text in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> like you just thought that that was just more dope. Well, that's funny. Know, you know, what's funny is I write in all caps. You know, oh, I'm yeah, one of those yeah, people like, that writes in all caps. Yeah, huh, so yeah. I guess for me, it would just look normal. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you know how like some people they'll write it, and I used to do this. I went through a phase, all caps, but the capitals were just a little bit a bigger little bit physically. Bigger. Yeah, yeah. I will do that depending on the scenario, mm. and I'll give you an example. When I write the path. Yeah. That T is a little bit bigger and the P is a little bit bigger. Gotcha. Because there's, we're 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 acknowledging the capitalization. Actually, yep. now that I think about it, you and I are very, very uh, aware mm-hmm. of capitalization of letters yes. in texting. Yeah. Oh yeah. They tell a story. They tell a story <laughs> for something. sure. They mean something. Yeah. That. So the, and then there's a difference between font and typeface. I'm unfamiliar. I don't know what it is. So you brought up something you have no No, but well you're talking about on? text like okay, so text back in the day is like the text uh-huh. and now it morphed probably a couple of times into different things and then now 
So, so you're most, telling me there's a difference between font and typeface. Yeah, that's another example of like these things that might have had a difference at some point, mm-hmm. but I don't know what it is. Like font. Like what is font? You don't know what font is? I think I do. Okay, font is just the letters that are used to, it's the it's the design of the letters, design the actual letters, design yeah. of the letter. Yeah, and then typeface, that's what apparently typeface is, the design yeah, of the letters. I don't, I don't know if there's any difference between these two. Yeah, man. So typeface is the elevated expression, I think. Oh, I, I think so. Check. All right, back to this italicized word. Light infantry always relies on surprise achieved through stealth, deception, silence, and maneuver on foot. I just wrote a question mark next. It's like always, always. Mm. We want to be careful about saying always. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to reflect the text. Sure, here sure. itself. Hell yeah. <laughs> Light infantry always seeks to retain the initiative. Now that one, the always, which in this case isn't italicized, I agree with. Hmm. Do you ever want to give up the initiative? No, you don't. Yeah. You always want to maintain the initiative. I, I'm sh- scrambling my brain trying to think of a situation where, ah, you know what, I don't think I want the initiative right now. I can't think of one. Mm. I can't think of one. Light forces practice rigorous fire discipline, but when necessary, they deliver intense fires on short duration to overwhelm the enemy. Check. Light infantry turns the enemy's weapons against him. Awesome. Which is, and what's awesome about that is when you've got, when you've got a competitor that is utilizing something. They're utilizing something. They're utilizing a, a some piece of marketing. They're utilizing some attack on your clients. They're utilizing something. You can't just say, oh no, that piece of marketing really hurts us. No, you need to look at that and say, how can we turn that piece of marketing against them? Hmm. Light infantry forces conduct relentless pursuit of enemy light forces and irregular forces to destroy them in detail. Relentless pursuit of enemy light forces. Light infantry offensive operations are characterized by a high degree of decentralization. Yes, which is contrary to saying, I better have radio to coordinate every single movement with you. That's centralized. Mm. Light infantry patrols relentlessly and aggressively ambushes the enemy. Light infantry sometimes double times into battle. Think about that. You're like, hey, we're running. (laughs) (laughs) We're running. That's an interesting thing. I'm concerned. I'm a little bit concerned. If I have to run to get to the battle, I'm a little bit concerned about what I'm doing. Because I'm running, I feel like I'm late. Mm-hmm. If I have to run to battle, I feel like I'm late. Yeah. It seems like that's like a flex move as well. Concur. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, we'll run. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if that's the smartest thing. I'm running, that means I'm late, and now I'm tired when I show up. Yeah, a little bit more. I mean, I'm not saying you can't hey, function, I'm saying you're a little more tired than you would have been. Do we get a cool flex, right? Yeah. Do we get to say, look, we'll run. Yeah, we'll look, yeah. We'll run. Maybe like, cause it's, it could have been, it could be, I guess, under certain circumstances, be like a psychological warfare situation. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah. in football, that's how it was, where it's like, mm-hmm. hustle off the field, hustle on the field, right? Yeah. When you think about it, okay, there might be a time-saving element to that, yeah. for sure, but bro, if I'm, really not hustling on and off the field. I got more energy for the play. See what I'm yeah. Saying? I'll tell you what, when you run, when, when like you see kids wrestling yeah, and one kid runs, like they go out of bounds. Uh, one kid runs yeah. back, yeah. runs back neat, you know, toe on the line, ready. Yeah. And the other kids wander Crawls back over back. Psychological <laughs> warfare. Yeah. yeah psychological so warfare. Maybe that's why they're mm-hmm. saying that. Maybe, I think you're right. I think it might be in the parlance of our time, a little flex. Yep. <laughs> Light infantry tracks, listens, locates, cuts off raids, and ambushes the enemy. Isn't that weird to think about? When you're in, you're, when you're competing against someone, you actually should think you should be tracking, listening, locating, cut off, raiding, and ambushing them. Mm-hmm. Think, think about how the thing that I like about that is you're focused on them. The thing I don't like about it is you're focused on them. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a little dichotomy there. We can't be focused so much on what the other guy's doing. We need to be doing something. 
the enemy never knows where the light infantry is or when he will attack check don't give away your position for the 50 millionth time i'm not gonna when when echo has a different viewpoint than me i don't start off by telling him my viewpoint and explaining why my viewpoint is better I don't, I actually ask more questions about your viewpoint and try and understand your viewpoint and get your viewpoint till I actually know exactly where it is Mm -hmm. before I reveal my position. Standing operating procedures are used widely by light forces for quick silent action. Yes, standard operating procedures for silent action. That means you don't have to talk. We know what's gonna happen. Next one, rehearsals, training, Pre-combat briefings and sharing of information to the lowest levels are more common among light forces. This is the cornerstone of decentralized command. Rehearsals, training, pre-combat briefings, all that stuff. The infiltration of large units of light infantry is possible in close terrain and is necessary for success in major operations. Under these conditions, light forces infiltrate to attack the rear, to establish blocking positions, and to create obstacles in the path of a retreating enemy. Yeah. Check. What that means is we're, we're moving into good positions. And we're doing it in a clandestine manner so the enemy doesn't know that we're, what we're doing. And the last one for offense is hand-to-hand combat is a required skill for the light infantry. Affirmative. Man, the, the propagation of hand-to-hand combat right now yeah. in the last since the UFC started is insane. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Yep, it is. I mean, even in that community it's it's insane not to mention like when you go when you explore the spectrum of the guy who doesn't know anything versus the guys the guys or guy who knows a lot Mm -hmm. even within the people of who knows it's so much like variety so it's so vast you know it is it is a insane evolution in since 1993 it's crazy the evolution since 1993 since the ultimate fighting championship, yeah. the evolution of combat sports is almost incomprehensible. Yeah, because before then, it's kind of like people didn't really have a valid found or a stable, we'll say, or reliable foundation mm-hmm. of fighting. And then kind of jujitsu kind of essentially provided that yeah. and everyone started learning it. So what does it look like? This is kind of the answer. The, the, qu- the answer to this question is what you're talking about. Like, what does it look like when everyone knows the foundation? Imagine what you can build on it, you yeah. know? Yeah, and I guess there's other thing. I mean, if you look at basketball, right? I mean, mm-hmm. basketball now is different than it was in 1954, yeah. right? It's a different game. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, it's a different game. But I think that's less, obviously, I think mixed martial arts is might be the most, but skateboarding, mm-hmm. you've seen what a kid will do on skateboards right now? Yeah, it's crazy. It's mind-boggling. Yeah. Surfing? I mean, surfing is nuts. Yeah. It's nuts what guys are doing from a technical level, mm. from a technical blasting airs. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> but not only that, blasting 360 Ollie airs where they're not even, they're not touching their board, but they're going up and doing a 360 in the air and landing it. If you brought an old school surfer from 1962, yeah. and you, if, you were to bring a, if you were to bring a 1962 surfer, and say, hey, if you go back to 1962 and said, do you think that a surfer will be able to launch off the wave into the air, turn 360 degrees without touching his board, and land? Does that sound possible? <laughs> do you, yeah. you know what I mean? Does that yeah. sound? Does that actually sound possible? Yeah. It doesn't. Re- it's kind of hard to. It's kind of hard to comprehend that that could be an actual thing. Yeah. You know, they'd probably be like, wait, what do you mean not touch the board? Meaning not grab that board. They didn't even understand grabbing the board. Like, you wouldn't probably had to say that part. Yeah. Like, how are you going to get a board out of the water? Yeah. First of all, their board weighs 42 pounds made of redwood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Makes it hard. So there's these, like you said, there's a foundation. Once this foundation gets created, you get to build on it. Mm-hmm. And what's that's what's so crazy. I've been talking about this on the debrief a little bit. I've been talking about it on EF Online. Leadership 
there's a base there, but people just ignore it. Yeah. People think mm. they th- they don't understand that leadership is a skill, just like yeah. just like surfing, just like skateboarding, just like playing basketball. It's a skill, and if you learn, then you if you pick up a book and you read, you'll learn about it, and you go, oh, I can use these moves. Yeah. And people don't do that. People it, it, people don't understand why is it, it's very difficult for people to understand that leadership is a skill. Even though they go, oh, that guy's a great leader. They think that that person was just born that way. Yeah. <laughs> they don't think, what are they actually doing? I mean, when I, t- when I was running uh, trading and I got to watch, that's what made it so obvious. I'm like, oh, that guy's not doing what that other guy did, and that's why they're falling apart right now. Mm. Got it. <sighs> Check. Next section is called the defense. Light forces can defend, but they are more suited to the offense. Defense can immobilize the light infantry, consume too much ammunition, and develop rigidity of mind. These are the dangers of the defense for light infantry. So, you know, we're, we're not feeling like we're, we're going to focus on that. Light forces must be able to disappear into the ground rapidly for defense. Light infantry men must be good diggers and fast. Light infantry men must be masters of fortifications. That seems like we're focusing a lot to become a master of fortification if that's not something we really want to be doing. Mm. Light forces defend on the reverse slope. I like that one because that's using the terrain to defend. Mm. Spoiling attacks are a frequent tactic of light forces. Normally, light forces are ill-armed to defend against armored vehicles, even in close terrain. This is a very important one. Why? Because it is acknowledging one of our weaknesses. Mm. It's acknowledging one of our weaknesses. So, here we are. We have this tough mentality. What is it? The never say die mentality. We adapt. We overcome. And we have that mindset. And we're in a light infantry platoon, and we're out there, and all of a sudden, we see armored vehicles coming. Mm. And we go, you know what? Adapt, overcome, we can, we can do this. Mm. And what this is saying is actually no. Is actually no. We are ill-armed. So now we see armored vehicles coming and we say, you know what, hey, we need to back out of here. Or we need to get in a serious defensive position. Or we need to hide so we don't get seen. Mm. So as a leader, you need to recognize what your weaknesses are and then you need to actually explain those to the team. Hey, this is not a fight we want to get into. Hey, this other... This other manufacturer wants to go toe-to-toe to us on making this highly regulated item. We are not good at making highly regulated items. We don't want to get in that fight. Now everybody knows that. Hey, you want to spend a bunch of money on a bunch of equipment that costs a lot and and then you get scrutinized over the production that you're making? That's not what the game we're in. You go ahead and have that game. Mm. So you need to understand what your weaknesses are and then you need to propagate those to the team. Light infantry counterattacks immediately to retake lost key terrain or to hit the enemy's rear or flank while he is attacking. This is what I like about this is this is a mindset. This is a standard operating procedure. When we get attacked, if we start to lose ter- if we lose terrain, just everybody know that we're coming back. We're going to immediately reattack. Mm. That's what we're doing. The light infantryman is invisible and silent in the defense by day or by night. Good way to do defense, not be seen. Logistical support. True light infantry is not tied to a supply line. Light infantrymen disdain logistics. That's so strong. That's so strong. As an an important planning factor, they can always, quote, make do. Disdain's a strong word. Mm-hmm. It's a strong yeah, word. Yeah, in a way, doesn't that kind of makes it seem like you're painting yourself in a corner? Mm-hmm. You know, we're anti this almost. Yeah, yeah. And I get it. I get it because it's a because logistics becomes mission creep. Meaning, hey, look, we just you know what we're gonna need water, and we're gonna need some. We're gonna need water. We're gonna need water buffaloes. You know what a water mm-hmm. buffalo? The like big tanks of water. We're gonna need water buffaloes. And that means we're going to need vehicles to tow the water buffaloes. Mm. And that means we're going to need fuel for those vehicles. Mm. And that means we're going to need a maintenance crew for those vehicles. 
And that means we're gonna need to feed the maintenance crew. You see where this is going, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's why I think we need to be careful when we open the door to large logistics because once we open the door, the freaking party gets crashed. And now all of a sudden we got, you know, the cops getting called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've gotta be careful on that in that regard. Yeah. Light forces can operate separated from their lines of communications by depending on enemy and indigenous Supplies, cool. Light infantry men can live off the land like Echo Charles can. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to see the comments on this one, bro. We could do some really funny stuff with you. Uh, you know, lost in L.A. What's he gonna do? Yeah. Hey, Motel Eight. This looks like a. This looks like. I think I found. I think I found. I, I, I think I found a location for me to lay up for the night. <laughs> Motel Eight. Yeah. Light forces make maximum use of the indigenous population for bearers, handlers, sorters, loaders, and so forth. Look, this goes back to what I said earlier, forming relationship with the local populace. You need to make sure you emphasize that with the team. Otherwise, what do you have? You have young men with machine guns and grenades, and that's what they joined the military to do in most cases. So some people came in with more idealistic visions than that, which is great, God bless them. But a lot of 18-year-old young men that joined the military didn't join for those idealistic reasons. So if we don't get them on board with the treating the indigenous population with respect and explaining how that indigenous population can help us succeed in our mission and explaining that we are actually there to support the indigenous population. If we don't do those things as leaders, we're gonna end up screwing things up. Light infantry frequently resupplies at night. The use of helicopters, amphibious craft, and like craft is vital to the resupplies of light infantry. Improvisation is a constant feature of light infantry logistics. I'll say this about improvisation. You can train for improvisation. Mm. And the way you train people to improvise is by making them improvise. Mm. That, that's what you do. You can't, and then what makes it hard is training by its nature is a structured thing, right? Okay, I'm gonna set up some training for you, Echo Charles. Here's mm. what we're gonna do. You're gonna start in the mount, you're gonna go for arm lock, you're gonna start here, right? So there's yeah. a structure to it, and we can go through that structure, and I told you what move you're gonna do, and you're gonna drill that move. So what I need to do is put you in situations where there is no move. Yeah. Hey, get on your back, put your left leg over your right elbow, and your partner's gonna go and grab your other ankle. Ready, go. You have to improvise to get out of there. Yeah. You can actually start to learn to improvise better. So we need to do that when we train subordinate leadership, when we train our teams, we need to put them in situations that they actually have to improvise because there's methodologies and thought processes that fall into better improvisation. improvisation. Mm -hmm. If you never think about it and you throw your team into such a situation, and guess what? You throw your team into any real situation, they're gonna have to improvise. That plan is not gonna be perfect. And if you don't train them to improvise, they're not gonna be able to do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Technology, next section. Weapons used by light forces must not impose a logistical burden. Cool. If equipment cannot be man-packed or mule slash donkey packed, the light infantry generally has little use for it. Cool, we're trying to stay light. light. The helicopter is almost revolutionary in its effects on light force mobility and logistical support, check. The delivery of the light infantrymen into the area of operations has changed over time, but actions on the ground have changed little. Check. Historically, advantages in technology have not been the deciding factor in light infantry operations. This is important. So we can't just rely on the fancy new equipment that we've got, obviously. That's not, that's not gonna make the difference. Not, it's not gonna make the critical difference. It might have a difference, it might make an impact. Mm. But historically, technology is not going to be the deciding factor. Next section is called political arena. Political action is often needed to support the light infantry operations. Cool, you know what that means? Play the game. Mm. 
got to play the game. Light infantry profits from a psychological operations edge and must be prepared to use this advantage. All kinds of psychological things. All these, the shock that we're talking about, the surprise that we're talking about, those things are a psychological advantage. And we need to be able to exploit those psychological advantages. Utilize them. Cooperation between a light infantry security force and the local police and intelligence structure is essential to success. What does that mean? Build relationships. The hearts and minds role in low intensity conflict is one to which the light infantry normally is very sensitive. (laughs) I would say that the light infantry should be very sensitive to it. But I also think if we as leaders don't explain to the team the importance of the, quote, hearts and minds, then we will not have them as sensitive as they should be. I don't think there's a predisposed mindset that leans towards people that join the military thinking hearts and minds. I think you have to account for the fact that there's a decent chance they're not thinking about the hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about other stuff. The last section is leadership. Light infantry leaders are generally of higher quality than conventional infantry leaders. I don't agree with that. I give that one the down vote. I worked with conventional infantry leaders and they're freaking awesome. I've worked with light infantry leaders and they're also awesome. I don't think they're generally of a higher quality. Light infantry leader traits are imagination. Isn't that funny, the first one, imagination? (laughs) The next one, flexibility. The next one, hardiness. The next one, endurance, confidence, improvisation, discipline, technical expertise, perseverance, and so forth. It's kind of weird to say and so forth. Because you listed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's like more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but imagination and flexibility. That is not what people think of when they think of military leaders, right? They don't think of imagination and flexibility. They actually think of the opposite. Rigidity. <clears throat> Yeah, kind of. You say that too, right? Where that were, or actually, it might have been another book where creativity was yeah. one of the you know attributes of a leader, or whatever. And you wouldn't really think that. You wouldn't think creativity. It's more like I don't know. Maybe the first thing that comes to mind, maybe for a normal person, would be I don't know, authority or yeah. something. You know, something a little yeah. bit more discipline. Rigid. Yeah, right. And I talk about discipline all the time, but discipline's only good if it's complemented by imagination and flexibility. Light leaders lead from the front. Consequently, they suffer a higher ratio of casualties than normal. I don't think this is something that we're super trying to make a proverb, right? (laughs) Right? Mm -hmm. I get lead from the front, absolutely. But are are we actually leading from the front to a point where we're a higher level of casualty as a leader? I'm not going to, I'm going to say, if I'm talking to my leaders, I'm going to say, listen, you lead from the front and you also position yourself to where you can continue to lead without becoming a casualty. Leadership is the most important thing on the battlefield. If we're losing leaders, we are losing the most important thing on the battlefield. I get it. I get the, I get the attitude, but we have to make sure we're smart about it. Junior officers and non-commissioned officers must possess skills above and beyond those of regular infantry. These skills include demolitions, artillery calls for fire, the use of close air support, and familiarity with foreign weapons and foreign languages. Fair enough. Fair enough. That comes down to all those things. All those things are just training. So when you're in light infantry units, you should have the opportunity for more training. You can get some of these skills. T 
teamwork and confidence in each other are vital to light infantry operations. Teamwork and confidence in each other. That is a huge piece of teamwork. You know, I call this trust Mm -hmm. as opposed to confidence in each other. That's what bonds a team together. I trust you, you trust me. You trust that I'll be there if you need me. I trust that you'll be there if I need you. And if I can trust that you're gonna be there if I need you, I'm more apt to go out and make something happen because I know you got my back. Here's a good one. Courage without teamwork is of little value. Makes sense. They didn't say it's of no value, but if I don't have some teamwork backing me up when when I do something courageous, (laughs) not what we're looking for. We need teamwork. Morale, esprit, and spiritual power are of high value to light infantry operations. What is esprit? Esprit de corps, it's like, it's like the bond, the mm. bond that we have. Mm. So there's not much clarification on spiritual power. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the team has to believe in what they're doing mm. if you're going to be successful. If the team doesn't believe in what they're doing, it's going to be a problem because mm. we are not willing to make sacrifices for things we don't believe in. Light infantry men usually, usually leave no casualties on the battlefield. I, I like that. Could be a little bit stronger than usually. Almost never, right? And that's different from the army saying of leave no man behind, and actually that's all services say that, and that's always the goal. Yeah. But you also have to make a call sometimes. Yeah. And that might be, hey, we need to we need to back off right now. We need to come back and reattack this position later. Because right now, if we keep going to try and recover this individual, we're all gonna die. <clears throat> Light infantrymen look to their leaders for a clear voice, for clear voice instructions, and thrive on the motivation of visually observing their leaders in action. Cool. Necessary sometimes. Clear voice instructions, absolutely. Sometimes the team actually has to see what you're doing and they will take action based on your performance. Mm. They will be inspired and motivated by seeing, oh, looks like we're going. And the last one, a light infantry leader can do everything a soldier can do and more. So... A light infantry leader can do everything a soldier can do and more. Now listen, on that one, you're not going to be able to do 100% of what your frontline troops can do. And you definitely might not be able, you you certainly might not be able to do more, right? You sniper's gonna be better at shooting than you. The radio man's gonna do more about the radio than you. The point man's gonna understand the route better than you do. So that's a little bit, not sure I agree with that. You should be able to, you should know how to do it. You should know how to do all those things, but you're not gonna be the expert, but you should absolutely do more. If you're in a leadership position, you should do more. More work, more effort, more sweat, more toil and grind and more exertion because you work for them. And that's what a leader does. So there you go, that's the document. Short, sweet, proverbs of the light infantry. Good things to think about. Applies to many aspects of life. You disagreed with a few things in there, which is uh, the amount that you disagreed with is actually pretty small when you consider. Mm -hmm. This was written 50 something years ago. Like that, that's. That's pretty impressive uh, staying power as far as all those concepts go. Yep, and I don't know if we'll ever hear from Major Scott R. McMichael, U.S. Army. But if we do, I'm sure he could clarify some of these and explain them in a different tone or different uh, different aspects or perspective that I don't understand. Mm. 
also, you know, the time that it's written, I think it was written in 1980 something, 1985 maybe. Mm. So my guess is as a major, he probably wasn't, he likely wasn't in Vietnam mm. unless he was an enlisted guy in Vietnam, just doing the timeline. Oh. So maybe bouncing these things off the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would, actually, I, I, I think if we discussed them, I think we would come to some kind of resolution on on some of these, you know, maybe that I didn't understand it correctly or I didn't see what the perspective that he was talking about. Mm. So, you know, and he might also be like, yeah, you know what? I I didn't fully understand. I didn't fully calculate that aspect of it. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, the vast majority of them are very, I'm um, in total agreement with. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times when those, when the language is that of always and never, so that tends to make you at the very least feel like, okay, there are no real exceptions mm-hmm. to the to that. And then as time goes on, you can start to see the exceptions. Mm-hmm. And then you know how one exception can, can, can kind of open the floodgates for others, yeah. you know, and you're like, oh, wait, we're seeing this exception kind of often. Oh, shoot, we should maybe <laughs> reevaluate or update that always and yeah. just be like often. often or, you know, tends not to or something yeah. like this, you know. Got to be careful with always and never. Got to think so, too. All right. Well, speaking of doing more, mm-hmm. it seems like we should do more. More work, <clears throat> more effort, more toil. Yeah. You said something really interesting right there at the end. It says you work for them. Yeah. It's not as intuitive as one might think when you're in the position, you know, of a yeah, leader. It seems like they work for you. If you don't have that intuition, you mm-hmm. need to write that on your you know, on the cover of your notebook. Yeah. So I have kids and that's another one, right? Where it's kind of like, it's almost like it's not, I don't want to say intuitive because intuitive is the wrong word. It's more like on the surface, like on the surface, the kids got to listen to you, you know? Um, but no, like you're the one who you're essentially working for them. So 100% your you're working job for them. to yeah. get them up to speed, you know, all this stuff. Yep. So, I don't know. It's weird. It's now like, there comes a point when they, they're going to be working for you doing them dishes, <laughs> cleaning the kitchen, <laughs> for sure. pulling weeds, right? So yeah, yeah and It's going to come. I think about that too, and I'm not ig- ignoring the benefits of the kids doing the dishes mm-hmm. instead of me now. I'm not ignoring the benefits of that. But that's not why you teach your kids to do the dishes, so they can do them for you, you know? That's True. not the primary reason. It's not the primary. It's not the primary. Well, it may be the primary reason, but it's not the most important reason. <laughs> 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 okay, my well, uh, emphasis on the word might. How about that? <laughs> so, like, I, I never, like, I always feel bad. So, let's say, okay, say one of my kids has a chore. This is real, by the way. So, one of my kids has a ch- has a list of chores. One I've of them, noticed that a lot of your hypothetic hypothetical situations are just real. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, fully. You're, you're, you give a lot of. Let's say there's a. By the way, this is real. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. let's just call it what it is. But there's a reason I do that only because um, I don't need you asking all these very specific questions okay. necessarily. Not necessarily okay. you, but other people okay. ask me these specific questions, and then now you're going to rat yourself out. Mm, yeah, well, there might be that too. But I, I usually am looking for the answer that applies to more than just me in my Got specific it. situation. So you're trying to broaden the expanse of your question. I'm trying to okay, yeah. check. So I always Appreciate feel bad it. if, <clears throat> let's say the chores are to, one of the chores is to um, load the dishwasher. Okay. Right? Put all the dirty dishes in the dishwasher. But let's say this child mm-hmm. didn't eat dinner with us. They okay. went out with their friends for dinner. Yep. They came home. They got to do their chores every night. Yep. Meanwhile, they got to load the dishwasher. All our dishes, mm-hmm. all the people, you know, it doesn't seem right. It yep. just on the surface, it just seems like, oh, that's kind of wrong. You know, it doesn't seem right to who? Me. Oh, making them do that. Okay. Like, it's like, what are you, my servant? Now you got to clean up my mess. Mm-hmm. You didn't even participate in the mess. You know, it's like, yeah, it, it yeah, kind yeah. of feels Look that way you. for me. Echo Charles the Merciful. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a bigger picture than that. Yeah. Where his job is that for a reason. It's mm. not to clean up after me. It's to teach him that in life, like these things have to be right. Like things that you can do, you know, to mm-hmm. function. So it goes beyond that. But you got so you got to suck it up, you know. Yeah, yeah. But also, you need to explain why, right? Yeah. You need to explain why. Yeah. And if you explain the why, then they go, yeah, you know what? That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't say, cause I told you to, Mm. you can't say, cause I'm the dad. Yeah. You need to say, well, here's what's going on. Yeah. 
Boom. I ask them, what do you call it? Yeah, I think it's this is a technique in sales where you ask them like questions with only one answer, you know, mm. like or, or it's basically this. Like if you say, hey, why can't I eat this uh, cupcake or whatever? And I'll be like, hey, you know, cupcakes aren't good for you. Right. And usually that just goes right over their head. Mm. Like it's not good for me, really, because it seems really good right now, mm. you know, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm like, OK, if this cupcake makes you less healthy, less healthy of a person. And one of my jobs, one of my many, is to look out for you, your well-being, and your health. And I allow you to eat this cupcake. Would I be being a good dad? Mm. Ooh, they can never say yes. Sometimes they'll say yes as a joke, yeah, but they yeah. understand. But they know what's up. You know, Putting the cupcake down. You know, explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing. Or they're just quickly biting off the frosting. <laughs> <laughs> what is frosting anyways? Uh, I think sugar butter. Um, a lot of butter and sugar. Huh. And then there's like, I don't know, some vanilla, maybe some cream or something. It know. takes most, I would say, 70% of the cakes I've eaten in my life were, were only, the the cake itself, not good. But you the frosting, like the frosting? Like when, you were, when I was a little kid, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to get that corner piece that was had frosting on four <laughs> side, three sides. Yeah. yeah, yeah, gotcha. Right? Were you in that game or were you taking a middle piece that had one side of frosting? Yeah, so oddly, and when I was a kid, yes, but as I grew up, I mean, it's probably just a maturity thing, really. Uh-huh. You know, you know, like, yeah, I, I like never, less less frosting. You didn't mature really? out of that. I didn't mature out of that. Yeah. In fact, I, I you know, I won't want to eat the cake because yeah. that's we know that's just weakness, right? Yeah, but the frosting, that's where the Sometimes strain. you're like, you know what? I don't even need to eat the piece of cake, but <laughs> maybe a little <laughs> knife snatch full of freaking frosting, which I didn't even know what it was until you just told me. Yeah, well, I understand. So you there know, you go. It makes sense. As opposed to, say, the brownies, where you want the middle piece of the brownie because that's a softer one. Oh, See what I'm I like the brownie that's a little bit um, like the hardened part, you know, around oh, the so edges. Oh, so you like the edges. Yeah, 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 I guess it depends on Man, the... Man, when you're a kid, like when I, I'm just, this is all just... When I was a kid, you know, you're just in the game, right? You just <laughs> you're tracking sugar like a little addict. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going yeah. Pete Roberts level. Did you hear? Where, yeah, when Pete Roberts was talking about having damn sugar cubes hidden in a yeah. pencil holder, hidden in his room. Yeah, that's going hard. He's going hard for sure. Like that's that's some weird, crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, dude, that yeah. Kid, the guy looks like he gets a look on his face when it comes to sweets <laughs> and stuff. Look, I got a sweet tooth. Sure, whatever, yeah. man. Yeah. He starts losing his mind, bro. Yeah. So maybe. Oh, that's right. That's where we had that. He wasn't on the podcast. It was we were up in up in uh, Montana, and he was ta- started going all sugar crazy on me. Started getting the wild eyes. Started getting crazy eyes, bro. Talking about sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. yeah. That's why he's a good test for Jocko Fuel because he's got a sweet, a legit, like certified, lifelong sweet tooth. Yeah. We're talking a crackhead that's got uh, sugar cubes. Yep. And he gets a weird. T- twinkle in his eye when he starts talking about eating sugar cubes. He's a good test for Jocko Fuel because he's not yep. in here going, well, you know, it tastes pretty good. Like yeah. he will straight reject something yeah. if it doesn't if it doesn't have that sweet little kicker. It's true. He's not down for the cause. Pete Roberts. Oh yeah. And you get a health person who's down always down for the, you know, plain chicken breasts and broccoli and mm-hmm. all this stuff. That guy who's like down for that kind of stuff and then he's gonna taste some, you know, some you know, uh, peanut butter, chocolate, milk, or whatever, yeah. and the thing is not where it needs to be, sweetness, flavor-wise, yeah. he's going to be like, oh, yeah, man, that's oh, pretty, the chicken, that's pretty the solid. the chicken breast broccoli guy, he's like, whoa, yeah, man, this is amazing, might yeah. be a little too sweet. Pete Roberts like, Negative. you know, if you don't if you don't knock it out of the park with Pete, <laughs> yeah. he, you know, he's like, whatever. Yeah, you know, he's he's over there freaking crawling around looking for sugar yeah. cubes on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> oh, freaking Pete, dude. Hey, he's doing what great. A beast. He's doing great. Speaking um, of uh, Jocko Fuel, what do we got? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, forget about the cupcakes and all this stuff or whatever. You know, if if we know that eating cupcakes, sugar, butter, frosting, brownies, sugar cubes, mm. if we know that that's bad for us, makes mm-hmm. us less, less healthy, and we have to be more healthy to be more capable to help the people that we work for. Mm-hmm. Check. Yet we still eat this stuff. Are we being a good leader? Good leader, good dad, good mom, good parent, good friend, good brother, good sister, good compatriot, good human being. Good citizen. The answer's freaking no, dude. Negative. The answer's freaking negative. And I get it. Things taste good, but guess what? Good news. I got good news across the board. Okay, first off, before we get to the too good of the news, the great news 
maybe some guidelines. Okay, we want to be working out. We want to stay healthy. We want to stay capable. Mm. We want to stay uh, mentally and physically in the game. We'll say we're going to stay on this yeah. path. We're all on. All right. So you might need some supplementation. It'll help you big time. Chocolate supplementation. If you're going hard, I'm going to say you're going to need supplementation. Yeah. If you're going hard, you're going to need supplementation. If you're pushing hard, you're going to need supplements. Yep. And we got a bunch. So let's start with a physical and cognitive discipline. It's the name discipline. Many modes. We got the energy drink. We'll call them ready to drink cans, you know, which is cool, I guess. The, the capsules and the powder called discipline. So the energy drink cans, they're available in multiple places wawa, wawa east coast east coast jockofuel.com online vitamin shop is that everywhere yep worldwide vitamin World, shop boom I there you go only in america but <laughs> yeah so boom multiple options as far as where to get it this is just energy drink cans uh vitamin shop has everything else yep. as well that we're, we're about to talk talk about okay so what are those things other supplementation joint warfare joint warfare and super krill oil this is for your joints and some general health stuff in there as well um, that'll keep you in the game big time, especially on the, on the physical front. Also, vitamin D3 in Cold War for immunity. Stay in the game. Don't have to worry about getting sick anymore. Because that's the thing. You start overtraining, not sleeping enough, all this stuff, bro, sickness will come and get you, take you out for a little while. If you just let that happen, are you being a good leader? Are you? No. You're letting down everybody. You're kind of, there was this book. Uh, you read it on the podcast. Um and it really, this thing stuck with me because I kind of had this inkling of this concept, mm -hmm. but I never could really arrive at it and embrace it as much until I heard it. Where it's like, it taught basically, I forget the exact words, but it said, like, if you get sick, that's kind of your fault. Don't let your own thing affect the team kind of mm -hmm. thing. It was like, oh, it was, it was one of these things where it's kind of like if you get, <laughs> it was it was kind of kind of raw because sometimes Bro, you just get sick. You get it does happen. dysentery yep. or yep. some thing, yep. you know? It's like, sure, you can take measures to try to avoid yep. it, but sometimes it's unavoidable. This, the book you're reading was like, still, that's your bad. Don't let that. What book was that? I forget. But it was like, man, your personal shit, don't, don't even come over here with that stuff. You better keep keep moving kind mm. of a thing. Check. It's like, damn. I'll try and figure out what book that was. We'll, we'll go back to it. Yeah. But it, was, uh, it is interesting. So let's say we apply that philosophy. Boom, we got some measures, some significant measures. That's a vitamin D, three, by the way. <laughs> and also the cold war for immunity, boom. Also, the good news that I was about to present. We got protein supplementation, but we don't need cupcakes anymore. No. It replaces the cupcakes and the frosting. You don't even need frosting. Certified, uh, Tasty. accepted taste by Pete Roberts, the sugar cube addict which is a good thing in this case as far as like uh, what do you call credentials yeah you know what i'm saying yeah. so yes best tasting protein on the market straight up in the world yeah straight up straight up check it out hey, also all this stuff if you want to get it for free shipped to your house you go to jockofuel.com if you subscribe to one of these things you'll get it for free mm -hmm. shipping for free which is that's what we're doing to uh, compete with other you know, we were talking about big guys, little guys today, big companies, little companies. We got big companies out there yeah. that are like shipping stuff for free, yeah. which is good. They have the capacity to do that. Yep. How do we compete with them? Cool. We figure out a way. Yeah. Subscribe, free shipping. That works. Yeah. So there you go. There's an example, real world example of the light infantry mindset going against the big heavy hitters out yeah. there. It's true. And that's a big deal, the free shipping. Sometimes... Some of us, you know, when we check out, we see that free shipping. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Gotta admit it. So check. yeah. Also, jujitsu stuff because we're doing jujitsu now. We're back. Yeah, back we're in back. the game. Way back. Coronavirus. No I more. remember that. Yeah. Old, you know that was thing. back in the day. But we're back doing jujitsu. Um. So you need some jujitsu gis, rash guards, other equipment. Uh, go to Origin. USA.com. That's where you can get them. This is all American-made stuff. Yeah, and just stuff for like wearing too. Like mm -hmm. things to cover your legs in called pants. Sure. <laughs> the best pants ever. Yep. Delta jeans. Get factory jeans too. If you're living up north, we understand. You're probably going to get the factory jeans. They're heavier. Yep. If you're living down south or you're living out the west coast, yep. you're probably looking at the Delta 68 jeans. Yep. And boots. You get boots. Yeah. Are, are they doing that wallet? 
Or is that yeah. just Pete kind of yeah, flexing no, on us? Wallet. He's doing the wallet. Yeah. I think there's a couple versions of the wallet. There's like the real, what are they, slim? Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Minimal, oh, yeah. whatever. Pete called it concealed carry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. He was up there all f- cracked out on sugar cubes. One <laughs> time. Could you carry wallet? <laughs> <laughs> he probably was. Well, oh. but, but like the, it, it is it is cool because every time like because a wallet, you don't just automatically think, well, I don't anyway. But when he will, he'll bust it out. You can tell like, you know, he took some pride in that one. Dude, you know? the, well, so they put out some cool stuff. Yeah. Man. No. Well, Pete takes massive pride yeah. in the whole process yeah. from designing it. And then the functionality of it, and then the production of it. Yeah. Cause think about think about something's going from his head, from his head to people's hands, yeah. passing through the the company being built by the factory. Like it's awesome. Yeah. So the whole everyone there, everyone there when a wallet goes or when a pair of boots goes out, everybody there's pride all over that oh, stuff. Oh yeah. It's like you gotta represent, right? You can't just be throwing in some half thought idea and be yeah. like here try this and then show everybody it's like bro we're, we're not doing that kind of stuff we're here. going we're all in real. yeah that's what we're doing we're not throwing something together this is all in scenario yeah. so is yeah. pete proud yeah is every person that's on the line creating this stuff proud hell yeah it's freaking yeah. legit makes sense also speaking of legit jock was store this one equals freedom shirts and hats and hoodies some rash guards on there um, some Warrior Kids stuff on there. Some soap on there. Jocko soap, Trooper soap, Killer soap, mm. antibacterial, char- black charcoal activated Satisfying. Soap. Satisfying soap. All this stuff. Um, yeah, so if you want to represent while you're on this path, you know, this is where you can you can get your attire, your gear. Also, we have a subscription situation there, too. Shirts, interesting designs, creative. You're wearing one right now if you want to go on YouTube and look at the... Yeah. Current shirt that Echo Charles is wearing. Unavailable, by the way, you missed it. A lot of people have it, you know, they're representing. But here's the thing, every time you're learning and you're coming mm-hmm. up with more dope designs. Sure, I try to keep a standard quality level or whatever. Check. Either way, it's fun. Um, yeah, so it's called the Shirt Locker. So yeah, man, sign up for that, you know, if you're interested and uh, check out everything else on there, jockostore.com if you'd like something. Subscribe to the podcast. Also, check out the Jocko Unraveling Podcast with Daryl Cooper. We've been getting kind of crazy with those. Getting nuts, as they say, but freaking awesome feedback. We'll we'll keep knocking them out. Grounded Podcast. We talked to Dean List. We're getting all those out pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Warrior Kid Podcast. And you can also join us in the underground. So, So we have an alternative platform that we are we have created so that we have control if contingencies unfold that we need to execute an alternative platform. We're not doing it, we hope to not do it, but things are strange in the world. So jockounderground.com if you wanna help support the, the alternate world if needed, you can, you can pay $8.18 a month. And we're doing like a, an additional podcast where we talk about a, just really interesting stuff that's not quite Jocko podcast material, mm-hmm. but it's Jocko life material. Yeah. Alternative and amplifying information. Material, information, yeah. Yeah, and look, if we're, if you just, if you can't afford that, no factor, email assistance at jockounderground.com. We, we're just trying to make sure we're taken care of and you're taken care of should things start to go sideways. We also have a YouTube channel where I am the assistant director for some awesome videos and then Echo puts some videos on there too. Unraveling is on there too, by the way. All of them? No, but where they're, they're getting rolled they're getting out rolled as out. well, yeah. Got well, a new one up there. That's good to hear. Yeah, those unraveling podcasts. I keep, I'll be interested to read the comments on those. Yeah, so that, that's a thing because those really run the risk and they have uh, had like a f- you know YouTube will flag it because of the material. Anytime you and Daryl Cooper start talking about <laughs> genocides and all the you know the the brutal Me and realities DC are going deep. <laughs> of history and you know whatever, it's like YouTube's like oh, yeah. pump your brakes well, there. One time we were talking about something and Daryl was like, you know, this is you know, this particular thing is really bad and it's just not appropriate, not not what you want to hear on a podcast. And, and we got done. I was like, hey, bro, I don't ever want to hear that again. He's like, I'll never say it again. <laughs> Like that's what we're doing, you know. Yeah. If we don't address, if we don't address and inform people about what th- happens when things go sideways, then people don't realize how bad it is. That's what happens. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, we're getting flagged, yeah. getting censored. Must be eighteen or older. You'd think that we were putting out freaking pornographic <laughs> material. We're not. We're talking about what communism does. Yeah, it's crazy. We're talking about uh, what authoritarian governments can do. Yeah, yeah. It is. In, I never got you know deep into history in high school and all this stuff or whatever. But kind of the the significance is going to be no news to you, obviously. But when you do present it in such an interesting way or whatever, it one of the many valuable things you can get from it is like yeah you realize how bad it was back then and at the same time by contrast you realize oh today isn't that bad even the bad mm-hmm. stuff that happens like man you kind of compare it to the whole of the thing it starts to it starts to offer this this maybe more enlightened perspective on things well yeah and it also offers you an understanding of why things are happening and how things happen yeah it, because look just like leadership is a is something that you can learn about from the past so is everything else yeah. and to sit here and think that we're in a u- totally unique time and that nothing like this has ever happened before and it'll be different this time that's freaking wrong yeah. that's just wrong the, the the way that the world works the way human nature works doesn't change and there might be different technology but just like technology won't make the difference in light infantry battle technology will not change human nature it'll have influence over it but we need to watch out for what we need to watch out for human nature inherently does the same things over and over again so let's be careful Check out the unraveling. Check out Daryl Cooper's podcast, Martyr Made. Right now, there's a lot of there's a flare up going on in the Middle East. You want to get the background on that? You want to try and you want to get get some understanding of what's going on in the Middle East? You don't know. I'm going to tell you, you don't know. And I studied the Middle East and the conflicts in the Middle East. Daryl Cooper's podcast, Martyr Made, is is a doctorate in what happened in the Israeli Palestinian scenario situation mm. so check that thing out if you can um psychological warfare i made an album with tracks and you can get it on any mp3 platform uh, there's no music by the way mm. just fyi Flipside canvas if you need something to hang on your wall we got dakota meyer my brother he's got an awesome company made in america Flipside canvas stuff to hang up on your wall got a bunch of books final spin mm-hmm. Starting to get some anticipation from people about Final Spin. Because, let's face it, it's hard to understand what's happening. You're looking at it. You're seeing some words. You're hearing about the story. You're kind of wondering what the hell is this about. So that's coming. Pre-order it now so that the publisher actually makes enough. Actually makes enough. Uh, leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual, The Code, The Evaluation of Protocol, Discipline Equals Freedom, Way of the Warrior Kid 1, 2, and 3, Mike and the Dragons, About Face by Hackworth, Extreme Ownership, Dichotomy of Leadership. These are the books I've written thus far. Just getting warmed up. I have a leadership consultancy called Echelon Front, and this is what we do. What we do is leadership. That's what we do. That's the only thing we do. That's the only thing we do is leadership. Big companies, small companies, that's what we do all day long, every day. If you have any problems inside your organization, I can tell you right now, they are leadership problems. And the way you solve those problems is through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com if you want to work with the Echelon Front team. Also, we have online training. We just put up 12 new courses where we go through each chapter of extreme ownership and break down in a granular level, how to implement these these principles in what you're doing. So check out efonline.com. We have the muster. It's live, live event. We didn't do any in 2020 because of Miss Rona, but we're executing May 25th and 26th. We got some seats left right now in Orlando. Get, get on it, Phoenix is next August 17th and 18th. That's going to be a hot one. Las Vegas, October 28th and 29th. Go to extremeownership.com. Look, we sell out. So if you want to come, try and get there quick. Also, EF Battlefield, we do battlefield walks. I'll let you know when the next one of those is taking place. And also, if you want to help service members, active and retired, you want to help their families, you want to help Gold Star families, then you can check out a Gold Star Mom. Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee, she has a charity organization 
And if you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you want more of my obstinate opinions or you need more of Echo's incalculable comments, you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, or as Echo calls it, the gram, or on that Facebook. Echo's at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And thanks to all the folks out there in uniform right now with a special shout out to all the light infantry. Thank you for making the sacrifices that you make to protect us. And the same goes to those that wear the uniform here on the home front, talking about our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all first responders. Thank you for your sacrifices to protect us here at home and to everyone else out there, you might not be a light infantry soldier or leader, but you can certainly adopt the attitude of the light infantry, the offensive mindset, the initiative, the total self-reliance, the flexibility, the improvisation, the discipline, the trust, the confidence, and a never say die approach to problems. And if you go at life like that, you are going to win. So go out there and get after it. And until next time, Zeko and Jocko, out.